1977. Most of the globe is consumed with anxiety and trepidation. We've just seen the Vietnam War, the Central American crisis, and years of revolutions. Against this backdrop in Cartagena, Colombia, a bold sociologist by the name of Orlando Falls Borda returns from the rural village of Boyaca that makes up the picture that you see here before you of an old Spanish town in the hills of Colombia. Borda makes the proclamation that scientists must not monopolize your knowledge nor impose arrogantly your techniques, but respect and combine your skills with the knowledge of the researched or grassroots communities, taking them as full partners and co-researchers. Although people like Kurt Lewin and John Dewey before him had argued that scientific inquiry should be available to all, that everyday problems are indeed worthy of scientific inquiry, it was these Latin Americans organizing the first explicit conference on participatory action research who pushed for an emancipatory and truly democratic approach to scholarship. Borda went on to reprimand the scientific community further. Do not trust elitist versions of history and science which respond to dominant interests. Today he might tell us not to trust versions of Kai which respond to Facebook, Google, Microsoft, and Amazon. Sorry, sponsors. <laughs> he went on later in the same speech to say that scientists should not impose your own ponderous scientific style for communicating results, but diffuse and share what you have learned with the people in a manner that is wholly understandable and even literary and pleasant. For science should not necessarily be a mystery, nor a monopoly of experts and intellectuals. I'll leave it to all of you to decide if our Kai Talks rise to this standard. Science and design should be relevant and accessible to everyone. HCI has a long history of service, engagement, and connection with people who are at higher risk for educational, physical, and social challenges. Included in that work is the extensive area of participatory design from folks like Michael Muller, Suzanne Bodker, Allison Druin, Mona Lee Gua, and Jason Yip, whose Kids Team Seattle group is pictured above in an article from GeekWire. There you see eager hands reaching out to work on this large piece of paper with designs and scribbles and sketches all over it. And we can see the engagement and the passion and the excitement that comes from design being accessible to all. Work like this has been honored by Kai with the Social Impact Award and I am very proud to accept it this year. Previous winners of this award are on the forefront of efforts towards support for diverse and vulnerable populations. Each of them are pictured here in reverse temporal order, uh, and their work has really laid the foundation for everyone in this room. And so I wanted to take the opportunity, given it's the 15th anniversary of this award, uh, to rather than tell you in detail about my own trajectory, reflect on where we are as a community and where I think that we can go. So some of this work has been driven by what Hoshizer and Lazar called socially relevant computing. And this is the idea that we can, and I would argue that we absolutely have to, contribute to both research and society in our work. And as Margolis and Fisher and lots of other people since originally noted, this kind of work tends to also have the knock-on effect of bringing women and other underrepresented groups into computing. However, with all these years of experience behind us, we increasingly see that this connection is actually not enough. We must seek instead true engagement, true partnership. What does it actually mean to be a true partner? To take small steps to increase engagement in projects, in designs, and in our scholarly work. So what we see here is a picture of a participatory action research project in Bolivia taken by Florencia Maldonado. The project is focused on deforestation and sustainable timber practices, but what's notable here is that it's incredibly difficult to actually determine who are the researchers and who are the community members. Some are standing, some are watching, some are on the ground, everyone is dressed in similar comfortable clothing, and even children are invited to participate. This is a true partnership. And as many of you have heard me argue before, 
Feasible solutions to real world problems require intense and often really messy engagement with the people and the problems that are lying at the heart of these projects. So what does this mean in practice? Well, cross-disciplinary partnerships are absolutely key. There is no problem there. Kai people are great at bridging disciplines. And we are so great at it that we regularly argue over whether we're even a discipline ourselves or some sort of meta-discipline. Uh, but that's not the topic for today, don't worry. What I do want to say is true engaged partnered research requires equity for the people who are not researchers. With the usual caveats about all of the exceptions that we know about, this is something that we as a community are just not great at. If you doubt me, open up the wound of the question whether practitioners are welcome here at this conference or not. Ask around about what led two of our VPs to step down this year. Ask how many community partners who worked on projects that resulted in publications are in attendance today, or are even authors on the work. The truth is we're like any other scientific community, and despite our best efforts, we struggle with inclusion, a topic I'm gonna return to later. But the second requirement of engaged partnerships like these are that we truly consider the values, experience, and goals of everyone impacted, and we need to do it early. We need to do it so early that the funding applications haven't been written, that the research questions have not yet set in our minds. And this is really hard work. So let's reflect a little bit on how we're doing, because a lot of you are really trying at this really hard work. Specifically, I want to talk today about the history at CHI here of service, inclusion, and activism. So starting with service. Building on an existing ethos of service, three years ago, the CHI community undertook an effort to positively impact the cities that we visit, like Glasgow, the day of service. This step is just one in a very long line of efforts on the part of a responsible, committed group of scholars to leaving this world better than we found it. Liz Gerber, Dan Russell, Kathy Baxter, and others dedicated countless hours to making an impact in the community. And I would encourage you, if you don't know about it, to read more about it on the CHI 2016 website that you can see in the screenshot here. And just so you don't think I'm talking about CHI alone, I'll note that I was one of the leaders 20 years ago <laughs> of the first Deloitte Impact Day in the Atlanta office. This tradition has carried on for the last 20 years. I was surprised to learn it still exists. And not just in Atlanta, but now across the massive Deloitte community of more than a quarter of a million employees. And again, you can read about it in detail from their website, the screenshot here above. And notably, Deloitte is not alone. Corporations regularly do days of service for Martin Luther King Jr. Day in the US and a wide variety of other days uh, globally, other kinds of remembrances. And in many cases, the motives that underlie these are excellent. But in many cases, the motives are a bit murky. Universities are ranked in part by the hours of volunteer work that they can document. Corporations and celebrities profit off the press that they get from these events. So how do we, as a CHI community, reconcile the personal and organizational benefit of these kinds of events from our quest for positive community outcomes? So let's return to the Chi for Good Days of Service. So Chi for Good Day of Service 2017 chairs were kind enough to post a summary of their work online. They note that 53 attendees spent an entire Sunday to volunteer their time and skills to help nine nonprofits in Colorado. The volunteers did work in which they are expert, that the nonprofits greatly appreciated, including accessibility projects, short interviews, even rapid usability assessments. Most nonprofits cannot afford this kind of expertise. It makes a huge difference to their operations. The volunteers also reported liking the event. Their reasons were a little different, as you might imagine. They were focused on networking opportunities, meeting new friends, working on real world problems, and learning new skills. So these patterns are similar to what you see come out of civic hackathons, app jams, and other kinds of professional service in our community. And by all measures that we traditionally use for a day of service like this, the year was a huge success. And what's more, we have empirical evidence of that success, which is something we tend to really like around here. But 
and part of you knew there was a but coming. But as great of a day of service as this was, as important of a step as these kinds of activities are, I think we can do better. And in fact, I think we must do better if we actually want to align our service with our values and engage the community as partners. So let me tell you why. Days of service also represent some of the challenges of our own privilege. How can we go beyond service to true collaboration? How can we bring to bear our extensive resources while still listening to the community and valuing their expertise and their lived experiences? It's worth reflecting on the vast body of literature on service learning and the smaller body on days of service more broadly. So what have they found? Well, not surprisingly, nonprofits and NGOs tend to be pretty happy. They like the help of the volunteers and the service learners. They need that help. The people giving their time also tend to be happy with the experience. But it's not without its challenges. Randy Stoker and Elizabeth Tryon wrote an outstanding book based on interviews and focus groups with nonprofits in Madison, Wisconsin, and their experiences of service learners, the unheard voices, which you can see on the left-hand side of the slide there. Their work shows that nonprofits are often exhausted by short-term volunteers, spending an enormous amount of time training and supporting them. In 1995, Keith Morton declared that the charity model reinforces stereotypes. Kahn and Westheimer the next year and a whole variety of other scholars in years since have followed up with direct evidence that supports this claim. So what explains some of this? Well, Bacon in 2002 noted that community organizers tend to see themselves as learners. They link learning to action. They see learning as a collective activity that we're all in together. Faculty, on the other hand, tend to see themselves as experts, keepers of knowledge that they will generously impart upon the students and agencies with whom they're working. And years before these observations, in 1998, John Ebby wrote a particularly damning piece titled, Why Service Learning is Bad. In this work, he notes that poor communities can be exploited as places of learning. And I can tell you from my personal experiences that universities often leave a trail of wreckage behind them. As a graduate student at Georgia Tech that Batia so nicely referenced earlier, the tension of a black community serving as the research site for decades to a largely white and almost entirely male and middle class community of students could be felt in nearly every interaction. The work there of Chris Ladantek, who you'll hear from later, Carl DeSalvo and others, has done wonders to heal these wounds, but they are no doubt deep. And I have lost count of the number of times since coming to UCI that a teacher in Compton or a mom in Santa Ana has said to me, Jillian, you are different. You work with us. And I credit the work of many of my other colleagues at UCI with standing alongside me in that commitment to true community engagement with healing these wounds and starting this process, but again, they are still there. So given that backdrop, it is perhaps no surprise that in the vast scholarship on service learning and days of service, there tends to be a lack of research on community outcomes. Vernon and Ward in 1999 produced one of the few mass surveys of nonprofits working with service learners and found that they were overwhelmingly satisfied, but also frustrated by students' schedules and short-term commitments. We need more research, and a lot of it, to know what the true impact is of the work that we are lauding as having positive social impact, including my own. And there is a bias in service learning research towards student outcomes. There is a bias in assessment of days of service towards volunteer outcomes. And there is a bias in social impact research at CHI towards research outcomes. And so this brings us to an interview two months ago with Joe Fish K on the blog Changing Academic Life. Um, I think most of you probably know Joe Fish, um, and he was the CHI chair in 2016. The year the theme was CHI for Good, it was the year that started the day of service, and he's an example of someone who is committed to social impact. And yet, Joe Fish knows, and I suspect he knows deeply, that if we are to be honest and truly reflect, we are biasing ourselves towards research outcomes over community outcomes at every conference, in every grant cycle, and therefore in each day of our work that is not a designated day of service. And so in the interview, he says, 
I am concerned the way we treat publications as the way to make success in the world. I know, and you know, and Joe Fish knows, we can't fix this system alone. No one person in this room can just say, ah, forget it, forget publications, right? I'm in an immense position of privilege. I'm an endowed full professor at a major research university in a wealthy state in a wealthy country. I am swimming in privilege. And even I can't just say forget research publications. Nor would I want to, right? But we do still have major structural issues that must be addressed to ensure that the communities we study are not exploited like natural resources for the harvesting exploited like the timber that has been cut in South America and the coal that has been dug in Appalachia and the diamonds that have been mined in Africa and all the people exploited in those extracts. Community outcomes must be measured. They must be reported. And the reporting must matter to us, to our colleagues, to our universities, and to our CEOs. So how do we actually get to that point? Well, a good first step is true inclusion. So the Kai community has always been a place of greater diversity than some similar and surrounding academic communities. Recent efforts have also focused on expanding that diversity further still. Diversity of experience and physical bodies, diversity of thought, diversity of sexuality, of age, of racial, ethnic, and gender identities. But what happens once we have recruited this diverse community? How do we ensure long-term inclusion in all activities and in the highest levels of leadership? Stacy Branham, one of my colleagues at UC Irvine and a panelist today, recently wrote a compelling piece on making her home wheelchair accessible. Having no wheelchair users in her own home, she notes that people with disabilities ought to be able to visit other people. And I admit, this part filled me with a deep shame. I've worked with multiple wheelchair users over the years. I've never thought about Stacy's poignant comment that a wheelchair using collaborator or TA ought to be able to visit her. Never mind the imagined child with a disability she wants to include in play with her own child. Most striking in her commentary, however, was how many people she noted asked her, why would you do this? Why do you even care? Stacy ends her article with the often used but still relevant and important, I don't know how to explain to you that you should care about other people. I'm proud of Stacy's step toward an inclusivity she is not even sure she needs yet. But honestly, if we manage to recruit wheelchair users as RTAs, collaborators, and friends, what on earth were we planning to do with them when we got them here? No, I have not retrofitted my own 1980s home, for those of you wondering. <laughs> and I know, I know, but I'll just say I admire her right now more than myself. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> but yes, I do see this as a poignant metaphor for Kai more broadly. And so, Kai community, meet RJ Dorama. <laughs> RJ is blind, and he's an amazing community organizer who runs the Makapo Aquatics Project. He's also been the primary community partner on a project my PhD student, Mark Baldwin, uh, has been working on for the last two years. RJ co-authored a paper with us, and he came all the way to the UK to participate in the workshop on blind navigation, seen on the right in this tweet from Jose Guerrero. We were able to invite a community partner to attend CHI, and he was able to take time away from his work to participate something, in something that, quite honestly, is not really in his value chain. The workshop benefited from his participation, and I think he benefited from being here. But wow, did the stars have to align to make that happen. I had to win an award with Associated Travel Funds. Thank you, Batia and committee. I had to already have budgeted my own travel costs for Kai that could now be repurposed for someone else. And RJ had to take time away from his own work and his personal life to travel halfway around the world to attend. And the CHI conference had to work with us to register him in a way that did not make the costs too unwieldy. All this just for a community participant to join us for a workshop. And we haven't even begun to discuss what it takes for a blind person to fly across the ocean, navigate to his hotel, manage CHI, and all the rest. 
And these interactions must become easier to truly be inclusive. And the challenges don't end there. We are not all computer scientists, not by a long stretch. I am one, though, and this graph worries me. What you see in this graph is that over the last 20 years, the numbers of white men and computer science majors have skyrocketed. That's the top black line there, and apologies for the graph, I didn't make it. Uh, well, the numbers of basically every other group, all collapsed on the bottom there, remain stagnant. I'll not belabor the point too much, but this is a huge problem. Is Kai more diverse than this? Yes. Do I also know a ton of women here who keep getting hit on against their will every time they show up to Kai? Yes. And for those of you who heard Wanda Pratt's incredible talk at Kai Stories yesterday, you know just how much abuse many women in our community have experienced. One of the primary rules for success in Jillian's lab is this. Do not bring a bathing suit to Kai. There is no story that starts with, we were in a hot tub, that a woman wants her reputation associated with. And that's a problem. And it takes us to a larger issue, because one thing we know for sure is that a lot of startups are funded by conversations that start in hot tubs, or in the steam room, or a host of other places that I don't visit and I tell my students not to go to either. There is no doubt that the world of the technology professional is experiencing a deep level of toxicity. Reminiscent of the halcyon days of the 1980s in New York City, a whole new era of professionals are living Gordon Gecko's motto that greed is good. This time, though, the culture is supercharged by global information access and social media. As Emily Chang warns us in Brotopia, without critically examining the history of the culture within computing and innovation in Silicon Valley, we cannot begin to repair the world it has created within high tech and that includes us here at CHI, but well beyond as this ethos moves into politics, all aspects of our consumer and social lives, and even space travel and a whole new era of colonization. And let us not be defensive as the high-tech professionals, or at least try not to be, right? If you are in this room, if you are even in this field, I'm going to assume you basically want to do good things. You want to be inclusive. You want technology for good. You want Kai for good. And yet Robin D'Angelo describes in her book, White Fragility, just why racism is so hard to discuss with those of us who deeply want to be good. It is hard to acknowledge systems of oppression that are largely invisible and beneficial for a subset of us. And so those who are oppressed are forced to do the labor of comforting us and assuring us, no, no, I promise, you're not racist. Well, guess what? As Avenue Q told us in song, everybody's a little bit racist. And everyone at CHI needs to own our embedded misogyny, racism, and prejudice. The structural forces that keep us and our scholarship reinforcing the status quo. Then we can begin to change things. And owning it starts with talking about it. So look around the room. Go ahead, it's not rhetorical. <laughs> Who is here? Do you actually want them to stay here? Stay in this community? If you do, we have to start acknowledging the privilege that we each have. And indeed, the people in this room are so very privileged by the fact that we are even here, spending a lot of time and money to attend an expensive conference for some of us halfway around the world, in a country where everyone only speaks English, at a conference where we only present our work in English. And we must acknowledge those who are not here, those whose visas were never issued, those who are fasting for Ramadan and thought attending a conference might be inappropriate or too difficult, and those who simply lacked the resources to attend. And if we can't talk about it, if we don't address it, if we don't actually acknowledge our own privilege and the roles we must play in making these changes, we are doing a kind of violence to those groups who we wish to include, whether they be underrepresented scholars or community partners. And I'll be honest with you, I struggle with this all the time. Should I speak at that girls in computing workshop? Should I tell a new generation of girls 
that things will be better. When I haven't seen much change since I was that one woman in my CS classes in college. Rachel Cargill, a young black woman studying anthropology, notes in the tweet seen here, unless the racism is addressed and eradicated in the places you are looking to make diverse, you are simply bringing people of color into violent and unsafe spaces. The challenges experienced by our LGBTQ, black and Latinx students, practitioners and researchers are massive. But you can also trade in any other prejudice for these words, and the point she is making still stands. The challenges of CHI attendees, who are also parents, are not to be underestimated. Accessibility remains a huge issue in a variety of forms, and we have felt these pains this week, despite the endless hours of the volunteer co-chairs in trying to solve them. And we do have dedicated chairs for each of these issues. And I'll note this is an excellent first step that many communities simply don't make at all. But how do we go beyond that? As Salim notes in her, their reply, we so often expect the oppressed people who, have, who we've invited into our communities to bear the burden of making them better. I can't help but notice most of this service gets done by junior people who have not yet risen to the more respectable roles of program chairs. How do we make chairing diversity, inclusion, service, and accessibility committees actually count on a tenure dossier or for promotion in industry? How do we truly include people? Here we see this year's SIGCHI award winners. You know them. You respect them. They are absolutely worthy of these awards. But do these faces represent you? All of you? No, I think we know the answer to that. So let's all make a commitment today to make sure that they do in the future. And this brings us to the issue of activism, one that Daniela Busa, one of our panelists, and others have been leading the community on for a while. And as the old saying goes, if not now, when? Long ago, by Kai standards anyway, Donna Haraway warned us all that technology is not neutral. We're inside of what we make, and it's inside of us. We're living in a world of connections, and it matters which ones get made and unmade. Our session chair, Body of Friedman, has long described the values embedded in our design decisions and sat at the forefront of a world in which we can design with a moral imperative. And Ramesh Srinivasan reminds us that technology is not about efficiency, whatever we may think. It's about people's value and their knowledge. But in many ways, we've always known this. Because the scientists on the Manhattan Project brought us nuclear power. And they also brought us destruction never before known. I was once so optimistic about the role of technology in our lives that Paul Durish asked me if cartoon birds follow me around circling my head. <laughs> I am still optimistic, pictures of mushroom clouds, such as the one on this slide, notwithstanding. But I do need to ask, are we this generation's nuclear scientists? Safia Noble in Algorithms of Oppression and Shoshana Zuboff in the Age of Surveillance Capitalism each tell deep stories in their own ways of tech's insidious creeping and overreach into our lives. The old joke goes, if the product is free, you are the product. But how many of us really stop to think about what that means in a deep way? Well, OK, a lot of us, right? <laughs> but how many people outside this room? And what role do we need to play in changing that? For me, the answer is clear. We must prioritize, protect, and promote community-driven innovation. Not just that which has a, quote, social impact. So by this I mean make community outcomes central and essential, not an add-on section to your grant or paper. Prioritize community expertise and community challenges. Prioritize inclusion. And once we have done it, once you have recruited your diverse team, you've conducted ethical research that addresses real-world problems, 
The community owes it to you to protect your findings, not to force you into a pattern of research first outcomes just to get published. And then let's highlight this work. Community engagement, diversity, and inclusion, this work has to be promoted as valuable and on par with other types of contributions. And the CHI community can lead the way. And in many ways, we are leading the way. The very fact that the CHI organizers sought fit not only to give me all of this time to tell you all this, but to give another big chunk of time to an incredible panel of scholars who are gonna give you their views, that shows a part of dedication on on uh, Kai's that ha they have to these issues. And there are so many scholars leading the way. For example, Daniela Rosner, who launched her book Critical Fabulations just last night and then jetted off to Iceland, reminds us <laughs> that design is investigative and activist. It's personal and culturally situated and it's responsive and responsible. And Chris Ladantuck is really on the forefront of digital civics and empowering grassroots organizers to take control of their digital, political, and social lives. And that's laid out well in his book, Designing Publics. Community-driven scholarship looks super different for every person in every community, and I won't offer you a prescription. I'm always happy, though, to talk to anyone who wants to work in this space, who wants to understand how you might approach this kind of work, who wants to talk through the challenges of community-driven work. So please reach out and let's talk. But for now, I'm just gonna walk you through one example of how community-driven innovation has worked for me. So what you see in these four pictures here are shots from the Technology in the Workplace program. In this program, which was initiated by the state and county local governmental run schools in Southern California and then co-developed with my team over many years, UCI students and assistive tech specialists are working together with students and teachers in the local schools to provide hands-on instruction of using mobile devices and off-the-shelf technologies to support students who have challenges to employment. And from this work came a realization that students with barriers to employment need interview prep and none of the available tools at the time worked for what they needed. So an innovative group of undergraduates co-developed the VidCoach app with our community partners in response, and then they made it available for free online. And it, we did conduct research on it, of course, and found that use of video modeling resulted in measurable improvements in interview performance and high satisfaction. But from this work emerged a whole other stream of work. This notion that while well, practice and therapy are great, such as through the VidCoach app, actually real-time intervention was what the co-designers and the community partners really wanted. And so Luann Boyd's dissertation work showed us the power of augmented reality co-designed with teams of teachers, students with autism, and other community groups in supporting these same kinds of challenges. Your particular brand of community-engaged research will not look like mine, but I hope that you will agree that it is imperative that we support conduct and promote this kind of scholarship. I said before that I am still optimistic, and I am. Nothing makes me more optimistic than watching the first couple of days of Kai from afar via Twitter. Casey Fiesler tweeted the slide on the top left from the Kai for Evil workshop over the weekend, showing Dr. Evil and asking participants to speculate on the negative effects of HCI research. Geraldine Fitzpatrick, shown on the bottom left, spoke at a workshop on how to be a good ally, run by this year's equity chairs, Kale Passmore and Kaylee MacArthur. And I, Stefan08, noted that the inclusive restrooms are just one example of our organizers being good allies. Finally, on the right, Stefan Krettenmeyer posted this Cult of Responsibility Manifesto from a Kai workshop, including such gems as, responsibility is done when you're dead. And inclusive responsibility sparks innovation. I am super sad I missed these discussions, but I loved watching them from afar. And so I hope today that I've seeded some more discussions. I am optimistic. Kai can lead the way, but we have to do the work. Structural changes can start anywhere. And I want to challenge all of you to go out and think about what challenges you and we can make today. Go back to your universities and to your managers and fight for this change. Ask, how might community-driven work be assessed in hiring tenure and promotion materials? 
At UCI, we submit a letter alongside every tenure package explaining that, yes, indeed, CHI papers are special and they should be treated like journal papers for the purposes of tenure and promotion. Why can't we submit community outcomes measures as well? Ask yourselves, how might we as a CHI community recognize and promote community outcomes? The Lifetime Research Award has an equivalent smaller award in the best papers that we see every year. We award research outcomes early and often. Why not community outcomes? Why wait until someone is advanced in their career to recognize social impact? And ask yourselves, how might we change publications themselves to better align with our values? We must be reflexive about who we are working with and what we are producing. Engagement in conducting the research, of course, but also in everything that came to enable it in the first place. We could start by disclosing all the funding that could have influenced the work and including our community partners as authors rather than just people we acknowledge. And here at the conference, we could add days of training on how to work with communities or hear directly from community organizers. These are small structural changes that we could make this year. You surely each have your own ideas. And while we work for bigger, longer lasting change, it is essential that we begin to take these steps. Second, use your privilege. Stand between the oppressor and the oppressed. Use your platform to critique. Don't be afraid to critique your funders, your publication venues, and your organizations. And the community must allow this. Those of us in power must allow this. We need to have tough conversations. And when someone gives us critique, we need to respect their lived experiences and hear it. And for those of you making those critiques, please be generous. We are all in this together. Criticism is easy. Constructive critique is really hard. So let's work together to hear one another, to read things generously, and to collectively determine our future. Because we control our destiny. The people here in this room, in these halls, and in the greater Kai community that's not present today. I've given you a reading list. I'm a faculty member after all. <laughs> I've given you some good starting points, but you have to do the work. We must commit to collective self-determination, to a world in which we together decide what is important, a Kai that enables us to live our values and go beyond the simple idea that our research can have social impacts, to a view that engagement should be intentional and committed and woven into the very fabric of our community's core. So I'll just close by noting that it takes a village. And here are just some of the many people and organizations who have collaborated with and supported the work and the arguments from this talk over many years. And thank you. If I have my timing right, Bati, I think we have time for maybe one or two questions while the panel gets themselves settled up there and then I'll introduce them. I have a very important question. Yes. Is this recorded? Uh, so far as I know, it has been recorded. Good. <laughs> or at least live streamed. So if you don't want your questions to be live streamed, I didn't turn the live stream off right now. It is. <laughs> Trust me, that's not why he was asking. I wanted the <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? I know we've all gotten used to Gregory asking the first question at every talk he's in. I have a second, but I won't do it. <laughs> Hi, Alana Yurosh, University of Minnesota. I, I know you know me, but you know, for the others. 
I have I have a lot of questions. Mostly they're like how questions, so I'll just bother you later with all the details. But one specific one that came up as I was uh, listening to the specific next steps, it was about the authorship point. Mm -hmm. So. Um, one of my students, Sarah McRoberts, worked with middle schoolers on design, and she really, really wanted to include them as authors on the paper. And we thought we had dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's. We got the IRB to agree that you know, the kids could choose not to be anonymous. We got the kids' parents to say that they could be authors on the paper. But then the ACM has these authorship guidelines that say that like authors need to be like fully responsible for all the work that's in the paper. And while a lot of the ideas for the technologies we discussed in that paper came from the kids, obviously they didn't write the paper, they didn't, you know, they aren't really responsible for all the analyses we ran. And in the end it turned out we could only acknowledge them, which is exactly the problem that you pointed out here. So is our next step to overthrow the ACM? <laughs> oh, sorry. Did I? <laughs> um, I mean, is our next step to change that particular policy? Do we have a question from anyone who's not from the former Soviet bloc? Because <laughs> I have ways. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's funny that you should ask that. I mean, I. So the, for those of you who don't know, the ACM authorship guidelines basically says you have to have contributed intellectually to the project, you have to have written, and then there's these two other requirements that I actually think are the trickiest, which are basically you have to sign off on everything that's in the content. Um, and they don't look dissimilar for what it's worth to, to guidelines that are in medicine and, and psychology and other places. I think they're wrong, right? So I, I think the idea that you have to have done all four of those is kind of absurd. The idea that you have to have done some of them, yes, right? You, and, and for me, the primary thing is the intellectual contribution. And it sounds like in those cases, the kids are a major part of the intellectual contribution there, and, and it's, it's a disservice to not include them. Um, I'm not sure we need to overthrow the ACM, although maybe we want to for other reasons. I will not comment on that today. Um, but I do think that people who deeply care about community-engaged scholarship need to be in those discussions. And we need to have guidelines that actually make sense for the kind of work that we're doing. Um, and, and it's not clear that, I don't think they're being malicious about it, right? But the people who write the ACM guidelines probably don't do a lot of this kind of work for the most part. So. They're trying to prevent a different kind of evil, which is people getting authorship that don't deserve it. Yes, they're actually mostly, from what I understand, trying to prevent uh, your very senior faculty member from just inserting himself on the back end of your paper. Um, so it's a fair problem to try to so, prevent. <laughs> <laughs> Some, a quick comment, Amy Bruckman, Georgia Tech. Some of these policies are being rewritten right now. Uh, and uh, send me an email and I'll pass it on to the committee, which I am on. Ooh, power. See, we know powerful people. So everyone, please send Amy your comments. Um, <laughs> all right now. No. <laughs> ASB at cc.gotech.edu. I still remember that. <laughs> All right, so I think, oh, sorry, we'll do one more. It's okay. Um, Susanne Wall, um, Oldenburg, um, thank you so much. It is, it is very inspiring, and I'm thanking you for the reading list. It, it is heartwarming, but it also makes me sad at the same time, because some of these books reside on my book, on my desk. <laughs> uh, I love Shoshana Zuboff, for example, but I ha didn't manage, maybe sometimes I didn't finish the book. Uh, I, it is. <laughs> also, and there's even a German translation so that it could make it easier for me, uh, like quicker in, in reading with regard to accessibility. <laughs> but if you, can you, at least maybe in the room, give us some advice? How do we share that knowledge without maybe having to read all of them? Because now it is, it's a high bar that you are setting. And, and you know, I, I, I would say, yeah, I would love to read over that, but not all of this is happening. So what would be good ways of disseminating and distributing some of that knowledge from the top of your head, from the top of people who have been reading it or are loving it into the community? Because I don't see us, all of it, us, be able to read it, even though it would be wonderful. Um, I love that question. It makes me feel very guilty, like I should be writing some sort of textbook on this kind of stuff, specifically for an HCI audience. 
deep guilt. Um, but <laughs> that said, I think actually what I would like to do, if you don't mind, is pa pause that question because I actually think these three will have a lot to say about it. Um, I'll say my own piece, but I think the three of them will actually have a lot to say about that. Um, so I'm going to pause that question for a moment and, um, and let our amazing panelists introduce themselves a little bit. So we have Stacey Branham um, here closest to me, Chris Ladantec there in the middle, and Daniela Busa on the end. Um, and I've got a series of questions for them, but I'm also going to let you guys ask questions for them. And we'll start with that one uh, once they're done introducing themselves. All right. Um, hi there, my name is Stacy Branham. I am an assistant professor in informatics at the University of California, Irvine. Um, I am a queer woman in computing. I am a person with an invisible disability. Um, I have a mixed race family. And I design technology with people with disabilities. Um, and so when I think about, uh, Jillian asked us to comment on our vision of, of social impact for Kai. And when I think about that, I actually think about the CS for All movement in, in the United States. Has anyone heard about that? It's this $80 million initiative to teach computer science to every child in the country. And uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is, well, why not CHI for all? Why not HCI for all? Um, I mean, don't we want children across the globe to uh, be literate in how technologies engage and reify power structures? Um, but then the second thought I have, the very second thought is, we're not ready. <laughs> we don't deserve that platform because we currently do not embody the for all, okay? Um, and so uh, to demonstrate that just briefly, I'm, I'm curious to see who in the audience, by show of hands, how many of you know how a blind person uses a touchscreen phone? Okay. Jillian, you attract an amazing crowd. <laughs> That's about, I don't know, a little, maybe 20%, a fifth of us or so. Um, the only reason I can raise my hand to that question is because my postdoc advisor invented that technology, Sean Kane, who's right here, <laughs> essentially through slide rule, right? Um, and, uh, you know, it, it occurs to me that I got my bachelor's in computer science, I got my PhD in human-computer interaction, and I did not know how people who are blind, not least people, uh, or people with disabilities at large, how they engage with the technologies that I had licenses to build and design, right? And so I think human-computer interaction does not yet include all humans, okay? Not, not even close. Um, and so I have a, a second question for you. How many of you have ever used closed captioning um, as you're watching videos to read the dialogue? Perhaps some of you are watching it right now, very quietly. <laughs> um, and so, um, you know, potential allies often benefit from the technologies designed by and for people with disabilities, yet we're not in positions to develop accessible technologies ourselves. And that is unacceptable. Um, so, you know, what do we do? Uh, maybe we could all become Jillians. <laughs> Unlikely, Hari Bar. Um, <laughs> we do need infrastructural change, but I want to articulate how a little fish like me, I'm still an assistant professor, um, is making small changes in the everyday that I think will add up to a more inclusive chi and hopefully make us worthy someday of an HCI for all. And so I just listed a few things that I, I'd like to read off to you that um, maybe you can think about how you can start participating in them. Educate yourself about the experiences of people from marginalized communities from their perspectives um, and be humble. Uh, design all of your studies to include at least one person with a marginalized identity. I don't know why we uh, silo them off like they're a special interest group and they're only a secondary or tertiary concern. They're people. <laughs> um, we should research within and across identity groups. Okay, so we should be asking not just how do we design this for a blind person, but how might that technology then affect a trans person? How do we design for a blind trans person? Um, we should recruit people with diverse identities into our labs. 
Um, I work with people with disabilities, people who are LGBTQ identified, people um, for whom English is not their first language, women, people of color, uh, people uh, who are first generation college students, et cetera. And I think that that's not um, just a side fact. That is essential to developing the technologies that we need. Um, we should pay them <laughs> for their expertise, our participants, our students, um, designers uh, with, those, with those marginalized identities and perspectives. Um, and we should empower them into leadership positions. Okay? We need to give them those first and second opportunities so that they can be on the executive committee and nominated for awards. Um, don't let your advocacy stop at your office door. Um, and, and finally, this is one I got to add to my list today, participate in protests at the CHI conference when necessary. Um, and so in, in summary, I think we must do better, we can do better, and we can. So let's discuss. Okay. Thank you. So I'm Chris Ladontek, um, Associate Faculty at Georgia Institute of Technology. In the lead up to today, I spent the last couple of days making notes about what I was going to say in my very brief introduction. And of course, I should have known better because Jillian has said it all much better than I would have. Um, so I will just agree um, very, very um, wholeheartedly. But I think the thing that I want to draw out is that there's this idea of humility that I think you just brought up and this idea of collectivity. So that engagement is not a one-way street. Um, and it's also not something that happens in these one-off projects. I think the, the idea that we know how to value research outcomes is because we know how to count them, right? And how do we count community impact, especially when some of those impacts may have a very long uh, time frame over which they occur. Um, they might at first look great and then suddenly not so great. And so these are the things that are really hard to try to get a handle on um, as we go out into the world and as we work with different sets of people and, and try to understand what it is that they need and want and how can we serve them. Um, and I do think of it as a service project. It's not an extraction project. Um, that's often, I think, the case when it goes horribly wrong. Um, but it's a project of service where you sit down um, and you offer yourself up as a way to get from point A to point B. Um, and sometimes even identify what that point B might look like. Um, I think the other thing that we need to do is to really be critical of each other um, in this constructive manner, right? So I think if you go back and were to look at all of those individual research contributions over time, um, no single one of them would have said, I want a recommender system that radicalizes people, right? Or I want a social media stream that abuses people, right? But yet, collectively, the social impact of our work as a community has led to these kinds of outcomes that are operating at an enormous scale in the world. Um, and I think that's the, that's the thing we're sitting here, you know, rightly celebrating the social impact of an individual, but in fact we should be, I think, um, in many ways hanging our heads or furious at the social impact collectively of the community. And I would say computing writ large, not just HCI. Um, and as much as I would like to give HCI the power of being um, that influential, maybe it is, <laughs> and in which case it's our fault. Right? And so how comfortably, how comfortable can we sit with that and how do we move forward, right? How do we set out these, these next sets of steps and challenges over the next five, ten years to better be able to understand that the things that we make, um, they are multivalent and that oftentimes the valence with the highest energy potential are hidden to us and have outcomes that we would not ever want to see happen. Great. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Daniela Busso, uh, last one here in the uh, eclectic list. Um, I guess I represent the industry part uh, of this panel. Uh, I'm uh, at uh, Oracle. I'm heading at the research team at the Oracle Marketing Cloud Department. I did my PhD in HCI here at Glasgow University, so I am kind of local. <laughs> and um, I, from that industry perspective, I have to say that throughout the years, and I've been with Kai for a couple of decades now nearly, uh, Kai has been this wonderful place for me to come back to and actually do this type of work. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the activism work um, that I've been able and fortunate enough to be involved in here at Kai, be it for women and gender issue, be it for sustainability, be it for the actual the activism panel that we did in 2013, the social sustainability panel we did the year after, I think. Um, it's been a privilege for me to be in this community and uh, and kind of responding to Susanna's question about you know how to make this content available for me 
the activities that I've done at CHI have uh, always ended up building up a core of knowledge around these areas. And CHI and the workshops and the panels and the posters or whatever we did here helps build up the, the knowledge and the, an engaged and active community over time. And I also want to emphasize um, the strength of the culture uh, and the value-based culture here at CHI is truly phenomenal and is very unique. You don't really find many communities that are so value-driven as CHI is, um, which means that when you bring people from all over the globe together once a year in this conference and you have people that fight passionately for these values, like all of you really do, um, Every single person that goes back again into their work environment takes that with them, and not only in their work environment, but in their neighborhoods, in their schools, everywhere. So that's my piece. So thank you for those lovely introductions, and Daniela, thank you for also answering our audience question. Um, I don't know, Chris and Stacy, if you have anything to add to that, um, that question as well. How do you sort of school up quickly? Maybe I added the quickly part, but <laughs> how do you manage the reading list? I mean, I, I think part of this goes back to Jillian's point that we need to have incentives that are baked into the infrastructure of our field about, um, you know, really uh, acknowledging the effort that people put into engaging communities long term and being sensitive to diversity and inclusion um, and uh, equality issues. Yeah, I don't know that I have much to add to that. I think some of it's scale, right? If we're only doing this once, I'm sorry, if we're only doing this once a year at this scale, maybe we need to think about smaller scale opportunities to get together and to knowledge share. Um, again, and I think that, that also speaks to the way that we do community-based work, right? Community-based work does not scale to a billion users. It's, you know, 20 people in a room over time. And so those are the kinds of models that we can use um, to, spread, to spread knowledge around. All right, so now I get to ask my questions. I have about 10 of them for the panel, and we have about 10 minutes, so I'm not going to get to them all. Um, but one of the questions that I get asked a lot, particularly by my students, um, is you know, community-engaged research can really challenge your health, both mentally and physically. Um, and I've just commanded an entire room of people to go out and do this kind of work. So I'm hoping you can give them some advice on how you stay well and how you care for yourself and your students and your partners and everyone while you're going through this process. Um, get a hobby. Right? I mean, like, if the, I think the thing, to, the thing to remember is that this is a, um, this is a job. And I, and I know that we're habituated into thinking that this is a lifestyle, but it's not, it's a job, and so we should have lives outside of our jobs um, and be able to turn off. I know several years ago, um, I, when I was still an assistant professor, um, at the request of my family, I took a risky move and decided that we would take three-week vacations in the summer where I turned everything off. Um, so no email, I would not respond. This was anxiety producing the first time I did it, um, to be sure. But what ended up happening is two things. One, it started a tradition of really lovely three-week vacations in the summer with the family where we actually focused on each other and I wasn't kind of squirreling off to a corner to look at my screen. Um, but the other was that the first week you're kind of still triaging some email but you're not sending any. Second week, there's really not much email. Third week, there's no email. It takes about four months for that to catch back up again. So you get this long tail afterwards. <laughs> and I really recommend that everyone take this on as a strategy because it turns out that there's a lot of stuff in our lives that we don't actually need and we don't need to respond to. And it lets you then focus on the things that you do need to respond to and that you do need to focus on. So especially when you're doing the, the kind of the um, affective labor of working with communities, there's a whole set of things that you need to be present for um, if you're constantly responding to um, the kind of administrative and other minutiae that is just always, always there. Um, you're not ten attending to the kinds of relationships that, that might matter more in the work that you're doing. I feel bad, it's like pulling the Microsoft over here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry for um, For me, it's kind of the other way around, I feel. I mean, it's really kind of, it gives purpose, right? Um, and that's actually refreshing. It might be because I'm in industry. <laughs> so I kind of like get the ability to really focus on my own choice of the type of you know, work I want to do. Um, I, uh, I do also feel that, um, uh, no, I'll just leave that point, sorry. <laughs> 
Stacy's just unhealthy. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, so I'll ask you one more, and then we'll see if there's any audience questions. So if you have questions for the whole panel, please uh, think, be thinking those through. Um, so another question that has been weighing on me while we've been here, right, is that high tech tends to accelerate things, um, and that includes our current climate crisis. It includes... Uh, the kind of civic actions that we're seeing with the walkouts at Google, the Uber strike today, and so on. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, if you guys have thoughts about both what role tech has played in that kind of acceleration, and also what you think it should play in addressing these crises. Um, so I'm a true believer that our role isn't to uh, simply generate new technologies. Um, much of my work is about looking at what's there and recognizing that things are working quite well. Um, and I think we are gatekeepers in a way. We ought to be to filter out what situations technology maybe shouldn't be in. Maybe, you know, we should exercise restraint. So for example, I'm studying uh, with my new PhD student how um, People who are blind, who are parents, co-read with their sighted children and recognizing that they've developed a host of uh, ways to do this, not least watching YouTube videos of other parents reading with their children and following along with physical copies of their books. Um, that um, I think we simply need a, a more awareness of. And maybe the co-reading te co technologies we generate have nothing to do with replacing that activity, but simply um, potentially enhancing and maybe using things that already exist um, in their homes, like smart speakers. I know. Now, I get, now I get all the microphones. As the middle-aged white male up here, I believe all the microphones now point to me. <laughs> Um, I mean, I'm thinking about this, sorry, <laughs> in, the, in the civic space I, is where I spend a lot of time thinking about this, and um, yes, technology accelerates a lot of action. Um, I think what's often missing is the organization piece that needs to follow, right? And so for things to happen and, and be sustainable and, for, and change requires a sustained effort over time, um, we need more than just an ability to quickly mobilize. We need an ability to organize and, and build out a set of capacities across a number of different kind of fronts as we try to make change. And I don't know that we're there yet. I think we're still in the space of thinking about um, the scale and the um, speed at which things happen and how do we enable that, partly because when we do work on social media, we're doing it in the, you know, sandbox of Facebook and Twitter, and those places are only tooled for that. And so I think, you know, you know, this gets to a larger conversation about what does this mean in this moment of like capitalism, and I, we, could, we could have a whole separate conversation about that, but how do we, how do we kind of take these tools and repurpose them? Um, maybe it's about actually reclaiming them in a way so that we can get back to some of the kinds of aspirational values that, that really underpin kind of some of the early moves in technology going back through, you know, the 60s. So, in the sort of applied design community in, in San Francisco, so we have a sort of organized design community of around 10,000 designers, right, and 10,000 design-related professionals, um, and we do events and everything, and one of the, the large interaction design conferences in February uh, actually had a subtitle of our Oppenheimer moment, which is sort of coming back to your nuclear bomb kind of analogy. And, uh, and it is really kind of like this urgency and the focus that I do think is required just to kind of wake people up uh, around uh, the, the dangers, right, that we're facing, potentially, who knows, we need to shine the light on them and understand them better. Uh, and then, of course, follow up with actual action and, and sustained effort around that. Um, I think that's what's needed. Uh, so I think we do have time for a couple of questions from the audience, um, and the student volunteers will be running around with microphones. Ben Schneiderman, University of Maryland. Thank you, Jillian, for your talk, for your work, for your commitment to these issues. And thank you, Batya, for leading the group that made this award. And appreciate, I, I'd like to focus on the issue of the valence of what we say here and what we expect from others. I appreciate it in your talk when you celebrated the 15 winners of the Social Impact Award. We have to make heroes out of the people around us. I appreciated Daniela's comment about what she sees the virtue of the CHI community. It's easy to be a critic. There's lots that we need to be doing. 
but we need to take a safe space to celebrate the positive virtues that we see around us and the heroes that we have. And so I resonate when Amy offers to do something, and I'm more concerned about the ideas about tearing down the ACM or <laughs> criticizing those who have failings. Because I think when you teach, we teach children by positive. We don't punish them to teach them. We teach them by showing them virtue. And I'd like to add to your books Hans Rosling's Factfulness and Steven Pinker's On Enlightenment. Both of these take a positive view that the accomplishments and the growth and the positive changes, especially in the past 30 years, need to be celebrated, and yet the tone is negative. And the celebration is because we need to honor those who have made such progress. And Kai is such a positive community because it has done so many of these things already. Now there's, again, more to be done. I don't want to say that, but I think we need to reflect on the positivity. And I just, you know, the Social Impact Award is one of the great satisfactions of my life. I created that award 15 years ago by offering to the ACM to pay to make that award possible. And that embarrassed them so much that they made that happen. <laughs> but the 15 people who have been celebrated in all that work is an inspiration to the 15,000 students who learn and know about it. So I want to put forward a statement about positivity and encouragement to make heroes and celebrate the cases that we see as positive, virtuous examples. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ben. Yeah. That's a great point. <laughs> Um, so it wasn't really a question, but I want to respond anyway, because I think it was a great point. And um, first of all, thank you for creating the award. I did not know that's how it originated. Um, but that's like a great example of a structural change that was made that did make some steps towards people feeling this way. And I'll have to admit to you, I felt very uneasy when I first found out I got this award. I had this sort of moment of humility of like, there's way better people out there. Um, and my students said to me, we are so happy that you got this award because it validates our work and it allows us to go off and continue to do this kind of thing. So I think you're exactly right. Thank you for that comment. I don't know if anyone else. Does. I, think so. I have the mic. Hi, Amanda Lazar, University of Maryland also. Um, so my question is about the role, your thoughts on kind of the role of academia. So uh, what should we be doing? If our role is to contribute to communities, one could argue that there's other ways of doing that, right? Becoming a social worker or something like that. So what, what do you think our role is? And also, how does that interact with um, kind of technology companies? Here at Kai, we have really close, positive relationships with a lot of technology companies. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Mm. Can you start? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have a pass, I'm not an academic. <laughs> Um, so I'll tell you quickly, UCI has this um, crazy thing where about every decade they decide that they really want to take community engagement super seriously. Um, and they put together a task force and they do a bunch of things. And this is, I, I suspect, typical of every other university that's represented here as well. Um, and I've been involved in those efforts three times now um, since being at UCI. And, and what I can say is like, yeah, especially if you're at a public university, you are right, yes, we owe it to the communities, because guess where you got your university? You know, you got it from the community. You are able to have this amazing life where you get to think about deep things and do cutting edge research and work with students because somebody at some point decided to support a university. And so I think that's really important, actually, and I would argue that it's one of the best ways you can give back. If you've got the skills to be a social worker, great, go be a social worker, but if you have the skills to be a professor, you should do that. Um, and there's ways to give back, whether it's by teaching or you know, volunteering in the community or other things that you can do. You don't, not everyone has to take this specific path. Um, but I think, yeah, absolutely, academia owes it to the communities around us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Chris, you want to add? No, I agree. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Well, we'll have time for one last question. Hi, um, thank you, Dania Wild, University of Southern Denmark. Um, I hope I can disentangle what I want to ask because it's it's a little bit complicated and it's something that vexes me as I as I do um, work that's situated in communities. Um, last year, I had the great idea of working with 113 year olds from a couple of different local local um, schools. Obviously, I'd never worked with 13 year olds before. 
there were really good reasons for doing it. Um, and then I had 114 year olds for three months working with them once a week. And it was quite extraordinary, but a number of things came up. What, what we were doing is uh, teaching them how to resource their own um, biological interventions in their everyday lives. And so um, building their own biology kits and putting them together and stuff. And we discovered some things that were really troubling. 98% of them had no depth perception. Something More than 90% of them would put a screw in place and move their hand away and wonder why it fell down. They couldn't hold a screwdriver. They didn't have manual dexterity. They didn't have the making skills that I took for granted. You know, I grew up climbing trees and throwing stones and making things out of sticks and whatever. And these kids are not doing that. And they're largely not doing it because they entertain themselves through technologies. Uh, they entertain themselves in other ways. And there are advantages that come with that as well as disadvantages. The two things that come up for me as I'm thinking about this are, one, they are going to be the communities who are making the decisions about what kinds of things are made for their communities. And their perspectives are very, very different at this point in time on, on what I think as an expert in embodied design and embodied interaction. I, I, I'm very troubled by how to position myself in relation to this because ultimately the, the, what communities, it should come from communities. You know, it's not imposing things on other people. And a kind of parallel thing that I, I haven't quite worked out how to connect as I think about things like the cochlear implant. And the, you know, with the cochlear implant, okay, ex extraordinary technology, but it's absolutely decimating the deaf culture in Australia, which has a very big uptake of cochlear implants because it was you know, one of the places where the, the technology was developed. I'm, and I'm and sorry, there are big pushbacks, so uh, I'm gonna stop right the, there. The how, <laughs> how, how the hell do we somehow grapple with these complexities? So, so perhaps, perhaps, um, perhaps this is actually a pretty phenomenal place for us to bring this particular social impact award talk to an end because that question is actually an opening. And I think it's an opening to the things that Jillian has been talking to us about, about the very hard complexities to actually work with communities and with the values they hold and to bring our own sensibilities in as we try to work with and enable and empower those communities. So what I'd like to do is um, invite you all, uh, those who are able to stay and continue the conversation, but also right now to join me in again celebrating Jillian and celebrating those that she's brought here.